he has done pioneering work in many many famous problems and uh, i really don't uh, need to introduce him to any of the participants who are here so it's really an honor for us sir that you have consented to give a talk on this inaugural conference uh, for uh, ksom and one thing i just want to point out to the participants who are uh, 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 who are attending right now that at 3 pm we have the formal inauguration of this uh, conference and we are launching integrated msc phd student program here at ksom in fact we have some students here in the seminar room and that will be formally inaugurated by the chief minister of kerala so at 3 o'clock sir we will wind up this session and we will move into the uh, podium there that also will be covered live thank you so much professor deshwe okay thank you very much for your very kind uh, introduction i really want to thank you for this uh, for this invitation i'm very happy also to see that ksom is really living and uh, has uh, this program as you said about uh, uh, phd program and uh, and also organizing nice conferences i am very happy to be back to kerala I uh, was so happy to be there a few years ago you were kind enough to invite me for my for, to invite some conference for my 70th birthday and uh, so okay we i am going to to talk about some randomness and non randomness in kateski shapiro sequences uh, or zigal kateski shapiro sequences and uh, i will uh, i will start by uh, telling you what what it is about okay so uh uh huh yeah okay so if you take a real number x it has a unique decomposition as a sum of uh, an integer and uh, which is called is well okay unique decomposition as an in, the sum of an integer and an element which is between 0 and 1 0 possible 1 excluded and with this definition we x is called the integral part of x and uh, what is between the brackets the small one is the fractional part essentially for positive integers it means that you are just dropping what is after the decimal comma okay um so the sequence uh, n to the c so you take n to the c where c is a non integer real number larger than 1 they were introduced in 1933 by B. Siegel, who studied their additive properties. Essentially, do we have something like a Waring's problem for, uh, for those uh, sequences? You see, they, they behave as polynomial, roughly speaking. They have a polynomial growth, more than uh, linear. So, and prove that for, indeed, uh, for any C, there exists an integer G GC such that every integer is the sum of at most GC element from the sequence, okay? The a very remarkable uh, theorem was proved in 1953 by Ilya Piatesky Shapiro, and he proved the following, that in each sequence, when C is small enough, in such sequence, you have the number, <coughs> sorry, the number of prime you expect. Uh, so the number of prime you expect, it means the following. If you count the n up to x, so you have a family with x numbers, and since they are more or less of the size x to the c, the probability that a number there is a prime is something which is 1 over log of x to the c, or 1 over c log x. And this is why the prime number theorem would tell you that you have this equivalence, the cardinality of n up to x, or that n to the c is prime, should be equivalent to x over c log x. Of course, you expect it to be true for any c. Always remember that c is not an integer. You are not considering the sequence uh, n square, for example. So in some way, this was remarkable, and this is still remarkable. It was the first time that there was really a sort of natural sequence growing much quicker than the linear sequence in which you had infinitely many primes. Uh, okay, so maybe something about the proof of that. The proof of it was the following. You see, from Zigal and also from uh, Piatesky Shapiro, you have something, uh, Zigal was using the um, um, uh, Hardy Littlewood circle method. And so for that, you have to consider exponential sums. 
So both results are dealing with exponential sums. Now the problem is with finding prime in a sequence, you possibly know that it is very difficult to get. There is no real way to, to do that, even if you are using something like a sieve, a sieve will never produce prime, essentially. So the, 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 what Pieteski Shapiro did was the following. Instead of looking for primes in the sequence n to the c, he was looking in the sequence of primes, he starts with the primes, and in the sequence of primes, he tried to see which prime have the shape n to the c. So it means, if you think a bit of that, it means that if you take p to the c, p to the 1 over c, should be something which is close to an integer. So then you say, ha oh, oh, I want to have p to the 1 over c close to an integer. Well, you have something like trigonometrical sum that will enter the game. We'll talk about that. We'll, we'll see some other example later with more details. And so you have to deal with trigonometric sums of a primes. And this was already introduced by um, Vinogradov. Okay, so when he, when he proved it, the, the three prime uh, Gol, Gol, uh, Goldbach conjecture. Okay, so, uh, yeah. Okay, no, this is in the, oh, pop, oh, 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 I'm going in the wrong direction. Yes, this is better. So what is our approach? To, to study this uh, Zigal Piatesky Shapiro sequences is to project them onto a finite set. So, more precisely, we have a finite set, C, capital E. It can be, for example, the integers between 0 and n minus 1 or something like that. And you have a map U from n to E. And what we are going to study is the sequence U on the numbers and integral part of n to the C. Okay? So this is what we are going to do. And uh, our interest will concentrate on the fibers. That is to say the set of n such that u c of n has a given value in A. Now you see that there is a little star on the word sequences. It means the following that sequence has two meanings. They're rather close, but it may be a bit confusing. One of the meaning is the first to say that you have a map from n to something. This is a sequence of number. Another sequence is to consider subsequences of capital N. So subsequences of capital N, this is also a sequence of integer. So uh, the fiber is a sequence of the second time. This is just the reason why I put some star to avoid some confusion. Of course, it is more or less they're very closely connected. For example, if you have a subset of uh, n, you can associate to it a map, which is the um, characteristic function or, uh, I, well, characteristic function, let us say so, uh, which says that if you, an element is in your subsequence, you put a one and otherwise you put a zero, okay? So this is what we are going to look at, the fibers of even some blocks, how some blocks among the consecutive values do occur, okay? And the tool for that will be the density, the natural density of a sequence, sequence being understood as a subset here. What you do is you count the number of elements up to x and you divide by x, this gives you a frequency, and if there is a limit frequency, you call that the density, the natural density. It may not exist then you may consider the limb soup, the limb int. It may not exist, we'll see some example, but if it exists, this is the natural density. And since, uh, why is it so? Okay, yes, and since it will be more easier for us, I prefer to, to generalize it, to write it in the following way. Instead of counting the number, you just put a uh, weight one if an element is in B and a weight zero otherwise. So you are really looking at the, sequence in the natural sense of that, and uh, you, you go to the limit. Okay, so a basic example, and uh, this result was uh, available more than 100 years ago, indeed just after Hermann Weiss pioneering work on uniform distribution mode one. I will tell you about uh, uniform distribution mode one. So this theorem, I don't know exactly who proved it first, but I mean, after Hermann Weiss, and, uh, and some understanding of trigonometric sum, it's just some, something very straightforward. And it said the following, 
if I, if you take the n, so that integral part of n to the c is congruent to some given eta mod m, then this has a density which is one over m. They are well distributed in the residue classes, is what it says. And you see, this is typically what you have is the projection onto the set 0, 1, and minus 1 <coughs> by the residue function, residue mod m function. And this is a fiber you are taking, and you said this density exists, and all the fibers have the same density. So it is one little understanding, but already something. So I give some hint of the proof, because this you, you will see the, the, the main tools working in, um, very easily. OK, so first of all, you, when you want to say that the integral part of n to the c is congruent to eta mod m, this is the same thing as saying that the fractional part of n c over m is in a given interval, subinterval of 0, 1, which is eta over m, eta plus 1 over m. Indeed, it's, it's quite, quite trivial. Both statements are equivalent to saying that there exists an integer capital N for which Nm plus eta is that n to the c is between nm plus eta and nm plus eta plus 1, with the good uh, large or, uh, <coughs> or strict uh, inequalities. So this is clear, because if you take the integral part of n to the c, then it will be exactly nm plus eta. And so it is congruent to eta mod m. Now, on the other hand, if you divide by little m, you are saying that n c over m is between n plus eta over m and n plus eta plus 1 over m. And if you look at that modular one, it means exactly that n c over m is in the interval which is here. So this is the start in some way. The second part is to say, OK, if we know that n c over m is uniformly distributed mod 1, then we are done. It's fine. What does it mean to be equivalent uniformly distributed mod 1? You have a sequence Tn. It is a sequence of real number. This sequence is said to be uniformly distributed mod 1 if each time you have a subinterval of 0, 1, the density of the element which fall into this interval is what you expect is the length of this subinterval. Sub so this is what is to be uniformly distributed. And you see immediately that if you can prove that n to the c over n is in, um, in this interval, is uniformly, dist is uniformly distributed mod 1, then the number of terms in this interval is exactly 1 over m. And this is what you want to prove. OK. Now, the last point is to say that, yes, the sequence n over c to the m is uniformly distributed mod 1. So what you have to do for that, there is a nice criterion. This was when I was speaking about Weil, Hermann Weil. This is the Weil criterion is the following. What Weil did is to say, oh, ho, you want to count the number of elements in an interval. So what you do is you take the indicator function of this interval, the characteristic function of this interval, <coughs> and you expand it into Fourier series. It is periodic mod 1, so you, exp you, you expand it into, into Fourier series. So it's fine. And uh, now what you have, well, of course, you are going to tell me, but this is not a continuous function, so it's not uh, very nice. But you can manage with that. You can just smooth slightly the thing. There are different ways to do that. And what you say then is that, OK, now I want to count the number of elements, so I count the number of elements through the Fourier series. And you have one point, which is the constant term. And the constant term in this Fourier series which will be just the length of the interval. And this is fine. It gives you exactly what you expect, which is up to x. You will have exactly uh, the length of the interval uh, times x, the element. So this is fine. This is the main term. And now all the other error terms, well, if you have cancellation in the trigonometric sum, then you are done. OK, so this is what you have to do. And um, so you, you have to, to show that this sequence is, um, <coughs> is well distributed. So if c is not too large, then it's fine. You can, uh, you can get it easily if it is between 1 and 2. And if it is larger, there are some tricks to lower the degree by just squaring and squaring and squaring. OK. So this is rather basic. So what we have is that 
uh, of course, this result, the good distribution is the truth for polynomials. But here, in some way, we have killed the, the arithmetic property. And so we can see the Zigal Piatesky Shapiro sequences as sequences with polynomial growth and which are randomly distributed in arithmetic progression. So in some way, it is our res first result that you look at the, these fibers and you see that they are all the same. So this is OK. OK, now we, we, we shall go back to this example. There are many more things to, to, to say about this. But I would like to, to, to do that in a more general um, context. And this general context is the context of automatic sequences. <clears throat> so uh, I try to wave a bit the hands to, to tell you, uh, to tell you what, uh, what is an automaton. So Q, at least two, is an integer. And a Q automaton is some sort of machine. You can see it with a machine where, where you have wires and where you have lamps. So at the beginning, <clears throat> what, what, and inside, you have the following thing, that each lamp is connected to other lamps by different wires, which essentially Q wires, each of which has a given name, 0, 1, Q minus 1, so you can connect them. them. And uh, uh, you say when you, you, you start. So now, so now if, if an integer, integer m is, is written, written in base, base q, q uh, uh, the representation I wrote can be a proper or improper representation. It has no importance what is, what is automatic for proper representation is also automatic for improper representation. So at that level, it has no importance. OK, so you take a representation like that. And what you do is you follow, so you start at the point as zero. And then what you do is you say, haha, I read the number, the digit eta k. So what I do is that from S0, there is a wire going to another state. It can be the same one. It can be a loop. You have a wire which go to another state on which is written eta k. Good. So I use that. If you see the last line, you have to read it from inside. From inside, what is completely inside is delta of S0 eta k. So this is to say I start at the state S0, I read eta k, and I go to another state eta k. Next step is just what is between the dots. You are at a new state. You read at the next digit, eta k minus 1. You say, haha, I follow the wire and I go to the next step. Okay? And you do that and you stop when you are at a zero. And then you say, okay, to n, I have associated the last state. So to each n, you associate a state. So I hope it's not. We, I, I, I will show you. Uh, I don't know why it goes always in this direction. Okay, first first automaton, <clears throat> the first non-trivial automaton, we see some uh, trivial ones later on. So it has two states, simple, <clears throat> even and odd, and the, it is two, two automatons. So from each state, you have one map starting with a zero and other, another one starting with a one. From even, if you read zero, you stay on even. If you read a one, you go to odd and the same thing around. <clears throat> now, let us imagine what it gives if you are reading an integer in base two. You start at even. As long as you read zero, you stay on even. If you read a one, up, you go from even to odd. You have read, read, you have read one, one. Again, maybe you read some zeros. You don't do anything. If you read the one, oh, you go back to even. But then you have read two ones. That is to say, the number of ones you have been you have read is exactly given by even or odd. So what this automaton gives you is exactly the output is even. If you have an even number of one in the representation in base two, and an odd number of and the number odd, if you have an odd number of one. So usually it's more convenient to put zero for even and one for odd. 
And so the tumor sequence is characterized by the fact that if you read nothing, you have an even number of, uh, of one. So T of zero is zero. Now, if you have some integer n and you multiply it by two, the only thing you do is at the very end, you, put, you add a zero. This is the way to multiply by two, the same way to multiply by 10 in, uh, in usual, usually. So you put a zero, so you don't change the number of ones. But if you, uh, if you look at 2n plus 1, what you are going to do is just at the end, you put a 1. So you don't know two, uh, t of 2n is t of n, and t of 2n plus 1 in 1 minus tn, or 1 plus tn mod 2, as you like. Okay? So it is characterized by that, and it has two interesting consequences. First of all, if you count the number up to 2n of n, for which Tn is equal to zero, that is to say one of the fiber, you have exactly n term. The same thing for the number of odd elements. So this is a very, very regular sequence. The number of zero and one is really, really very, very simple. But on the other hand, if you start to look at blocks, the blocks, the situation is quite different. The blocks are not well distributed. For example, the block 000 or 111 will never occur. Why? Well, you see, if you take three consecutive, you, so you are looking at three consecutive values. When I say the block 000, it means the, the block when I am looking at Tn, Tn plus 1, Tn plus 2. If I look at Tn, Tn plus 1, Tn plus 2, among n and n plus 1, 1 will be an even number. And so the next one will be different. And so it's not possible to have three zeros or three one. So it is very regular, but uh, it's not uh, too well distributed on blocks. Okay. Now, automatic sequence, another automatic sequence. We considered it, which associates to the integer n, uh, its residue class modulo m is Q automatic for any Q. So it has nothing to do with M. It's clear that it is M automatic because M automatic, you want to know what is the residue, you just look at the last digit. What is the residue of 107 mod 10? It is seven. This is easy. But you know also that it is true. You know it from the elementary school. For example, if you want to say what is whether a number is divisible by three in base 10, you know how to do. You say, I am just going to see whether the sum of the digit is divisible by three. So on the digits in any base, you can read arithmetic property of the number. So um, of course, when I say you are looking at the sum of the digit and do, you divide by a three, uh, you take the residue of three, this is not the way an automaton can do. Because automaton has only, only a finite number <coughs> of states. So you cannot read the sum of the digit. This is not something you can get. But what you can do is each time you read the digit, you take the residue mod three, and you read another digit, and you make the sum, and you take the residue. And this is something which is only finite. OK? So you may work a bit on that. And uh, this is also, if you look at the fibers, the fibers are very irregular. Okay, another interesting sequence <clears throat> is the sequence which give you the first significant digit. So you take Q larger than two and you take the representation, which is the proper representation. That is to say that you ask that eta K of N is different from zero. Okay, you ask eta K of N to be different from zero, then it is well, de well defined what is eta K. And uh, of course, to get something which is non-trivial, it's better to take Q larger than two, because for Q is equal to two, the first digit is always one. It's not very interesting in a proper representation. A proper representation will always start with a one. Okay. So then you look at the map which associate eta K to N. And of course, this is clearly Q automatic. You read your number in base Q, and you take the first digit, and in some way you stop there, or more exactly, if you go on, you 
just decide to do nothing more. Okay, you have loops everywhere almost. Okay, so this is Q-automatic. <clears throat> now it is quite irregular. If you look at the fibers, um, they, may, they have no density. Maybe we think in, the, in base 10, we are more used to, to thinking in base 10. You count the number <clears throat> of n up to 10 to the n for which u of n is equal to one. Well, indeed, you, you cannot go after two times 10 to the l minus one, because then it will start with a three, with a four, with a five and so on. And so the lower density of the fiber one is at most two over 10. But on the other hand, if you go to two times 10 to the L, you are sure that all the numbers between one, between 10 to the L and two, 10 to the L start with a one. And so this number is 10 to the L. And so the upper density is larger than one half. So you see, you have example where you have a lower density, which is less than two over 10, the larger density, which is larger than one over than one half, and so you don't have a density. Okay, good. <clears throat> well, indeed the fibers have a density for a weaker form of density, which is called the logarithmic density. You remember the density was defined as one over x and the sum over the element b up to x of one with weight one. So you take a different weight, and if you take the weight one over b, then of course, the sum to, to take the mean value, you have to divide by the sum of the one over b up to x, which is log x. And this is what is called the logarithmic density. And in our case, this has a logarithmic density. It's not difficult to prove. And this, this, this density is log two over log 10. And if you have heard about Benford law, possibly you recognize this log two over log 10, which is essentially the density what of with which an, an integer written in the base 10 we start with a one okay so i don't know why okay yeah okay so c is um non-integral real number larger than one i say it again and uh, we consider an automatic sequence uh u and uh, now we want to enter into our program. Our program was to say, I want to know what is <coughs> the structure of UC of N, the projection of the Zigal Piatesky Shapiro sequence on E, the set of states of my automaton. Okay. And um, what, we, what we proved with uh, Michael Dormota and um, uh, Morgan Besser. Johannes Morgan Besser, a few years ago, is the following. You take some C, which is between 1 and 1 1.4. <clears throat> then, for any A in E, the sequence, that is to say the fiber of UC, the fiber of UC has a logarithmic density, which is exactly the fiber, the density of the fiber. We know that uh, every, did, did, did I say it? already that uh, maybe not oh well okay this is stupid yeah cobham sorry I, I i missed that the last of that uh, of that slide cobham a major contributor to the field of automata theory around 1970 showed that the fibers of an of any automaton have a logarithmic density so it makes sense to re to look at the logarithmic density this will always exist so in some way it tells you that if you are looking at the fibers, well, for the logarithmic density, it's fine. And also it tells you that if either of these sequence has a density, then both have a density and those densities are equal. <clears throat> so in some way, if you are interested in density of fibers, then, um, how to say, the, the N to the C, the Segal Piatesky Shapiro sequence is a good sampling. Well, for technical reasons, uh, we cannot go too far. We, of course, expect that this is true for any value of C. We have no counterexample, and we don't expect any counterexample, but we have to deal with some exponential sums, and this makes life difficult. So, okay, to be, to be improved upon, but um, there's no, oh, sorry. <clears throat> okay, for the two Morse sequence, then, it has been proved by Mauduit and Riva 
in the, um, in C, the, 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 this result for the two more sequence in one, four over three. And uh, then they proved it in 2005 for C in one, 1 1.4. And uh, now it's even better. I will uh, t tell you uh, when we talk about uh, two more sequence. Okay. Uh, well. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so, yeah, well, okay, it's written here. So, uh, again, for the two more sequence, Spiegelhofer improved the bound for C up to 1.42 in 2014 of this, uh, of this result. And uh, also for the two more sequence is up to 1.5. And uh, I will talk to the, of that because it is a very nice result and more general than what is written here. So, okay, before going to the, to the next step, uh, I have to, <clears throat> so we have studied for the time being the question of the fibers of uh, automatic sequence. So we want to know now in our three special cases, something about the blocks. And first I give you some terminology. If V is a map, from n onto a finite set E and S are positive integers, we said that V is S normal if any block of length S, that is to say BS, something in E to the S, uh, S applet, S tuple of element of E, if uh, this set occurs with exactly the density you expected, everything is well distributed, since you have, of course, cardinality of E to the S such uh, elements, uh, such blocks, you expect that the density for each of them will be cardinality of e to the minus s. So this is to say s normal, it means when I am looking at s blocks, then it is no normal. Okay. For example, you see what we were saying for the uh, two more sequence, the two more sequence is not three normal because you have blocks that do not occur at all. And then we say that the number, that the sequence is normal if it is S normal for any S. All the blocks occur with the density you expect. Now on the other hand, you may have blocks that do not occur and that the blocks who really do occur are not very, are not, uh, very numerous. For example, you would say that it is deterministic if the number of blocks is sub-exponential, is e to the little of x. Of course, since it is e to the x, you don't care much about the value of e. It can be uh, uh, 2 to the little of s, s. s. has no, no, no importance. So it is, so sub is sub-exponential. Uh, and we said that it is polynomial, linear. linear. It has polynomial or linear complexity. The number of blocks of length s is bounded by a polynomial or a linear function of S. Okay, so I said it already for the two more sequence. And for example, also with the residues, the residues, if you take the block 0, 0, it will not occur in the sequence, uh, in the sequence residue, because if an element has a residue 0, the next one will be 1. So you don't see the block 0, 0. So on the, on the blocks, it has very low complexity. And the blocks uh, 1, 1, 2, 1 never occurs for the first significant digit. If you have two consecutive 1, okay, fine. And then you may change, of course, to 2, for example, if you have 18, 19, and then you go to 20. You start with a 2. But then you cannot go back to a 1, even in base 3. Because if you have 20, you will have 21 after that. Okay? So... For all this example, the situation of blocks is not that great. Okay, it has been proved by Cobham, I already mentioned the name of Cobham, that any automatic sequence has linear complexity. Okay. This is not too, too, too difficult to, to see. Essentially, it is the, the finiteness of the automaton and uh, you, you have to go back to, if you start with, uh, with a certain uh, way to, to to, to go on your um, on your automaton, uh, you you have only finitely many possibilities for going from one point to the other, and uh, and so 
it is something linear. Of course, it will depend on the number of state, but not worse than that. Okay, now let us go to <coughs> step by step to our different uh, uh, sequences, the automata. UN denotes you know, the first significant digit of N here in a given base Q, at least three. So then the function U is constant over exponentially large interval. You see, there exists alpha such that any integer m is included in an interval x, alpha x, on which the first significant digit is constant. <clears throat> Think in base 10. If you are between 10 to the s, 10 to the l, and 2 times to the l, it is constant. Well, maybe it is a bit shorter locally in terms of x, but if you are between 9, 10 to the L and 10 to the L plus one, again, it is constant. And this is in some way the shortest interval you can get. So now <clears throat> the number of blocks of length S which occur infinitely often in the sequence UC of N, UC of N means that you are taking N to the C, you are just looking at the subsequence N to the C and you are looking at the first digit. But since it is polynomial, the the the, the uh, Piatesky Shapiro sequence, since it is it has polynomial growth, then still you will have lots of elements which are the same. And so essentially, if you have a block of length S, S which occur infinitely often, from some point onward, it will have the shape A A A A A and maybe A plus one, A plus one, A plus one. And so the only possibility you have is to know where you put the shift and where is the first term. The first term is something which is a constant and the possibility to stop, to change from one digit to the other one, you have S possibility because you are looking at the blocks of length S. And so it has linear complexity as regards the elements which occur infinitely often. Now, in base 10, for example, you can make it it's very short exercise, that this occur, what I was telling you, it occurs exactly for x, which is larger than some constant times s to the c. And up to s, to, so after s to the c, you have only big O of s, blocks of length s, and then from that, from one to this number s to the c, you have at most s to the c blocks. So it means that the complexity is polynomial. The co complexity of UC of N is uh, polynomial. Good. You can do a bit better than that, but uh, however, it's, it's difficult to find. By the way, we don't know exactly where is the, um, <coughs> the, the limit for that. Well, some extremely nice result, and this is why I mentioned it, also it's not a, a Piatesky shapiro sequence in the, in the stricto sensu. <coughs> then uh, Michael Dormota, Christian Mauduit, and Joel Riva proved, uh, indeed it, was, it, it appeared last year, it was, it was proved a few years before, that the sequence T of N square is normal. You see, this is, this, so normal means that you take any sequence, uh, any length of a block, this block will occur with the, the probability uh, 1 over 2 to the length of the block. Um, and it's not normal for the linear case. You see, this was very surprising because you have a, a sequence which is very, uh, very uh, anormal in some way. And if you look at it on the squares, it becomes normal. <coughs> so the latest result concerning Piatesky Shapiro sequence. Uh, for this is uh, the one of uh, Mullner and Spiegelhofer in 2017, who said that for C less than three over two, then the sequence T of NC is normal. Of course, C is larger than one as usual. I don't put it uh, again. So the ingredient, again, you have something. Now, why maybe <clears throat> it, it, it is complicated, first of all. There is one ingredient in Müller and Spiegelhofer, which was in the paper on the Dormota, Mauduit, and Riva. So it was on archive, and uh, they knew the, the 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 manuscript had circulated before it has it has appeared. So one one part of it is that there is one point I would like to explain why it may be easier to look at um, 
a, an interesting point when you are dealing with trigonometric sum, why two more sequence may be, in, may be easier. What, what a, a structure with, which is really exploited is the following. If you think of cutting, you have a number n, which is written in base two. So you, you see it as a block of, uh, of digit. You cut it everywhere, anywhere, and you look at, you apply the t function on each of the two blocks, then the t function on the whole block will be the sum of them. So in some way, you may say that t, you can look at some large part and some small parts and make them together by adding. And if you are in some exponential sum, well, exponential sum of the sum is something which is nice because it's just the product of the values there. So you have this regularity, which is definitely not the case in other um, automatic sequences, but definitely for those it, uh, it is and it helps. And you, you can prove something like that also for this case. Of course, again, what we expect is that this is true. It is normal t to the n to the c is normal for any c. We, we see no reason why it should not be. Although we'll see that uh, it's up, okay. Okay, now I'm looking at uh, the uh, S-normality or non-normality of the family of residues, M mod M. Okay, so uh, we let R, I don't think I use R at all, but RCM of N means the residue of n to the c mod m, okay? Rcm of n is the residue mod m of integral part of n to the c. Good. This is what we have used already, and we have proved, for example, that it is one normal. You see, the first basic example I was, I was giving was just to prove that it is always one normal. Now, for s in 1 to the c plus 1, the sequence RCM is s normal. Okay, this is what we prove. And I will, I will give you some hint of the proof to understand where does this limit of c plus 1 occur? Why, is, why it may be that we don't have this situation for larger s. Okay, on the other hand, if you take s which is large enough, <coughs> then there exists a block of length x s, which does not occur in RCM. And so definitely it is not normal if s is large enough. I will prove it at least when m is large enough to, to show you how it goes. Okay, now if you are between one and two, then we have a much better knowledge. The better knowledge is that for this, in this case, the number of words of length s is polynomial. It has polynomial growth. That is to say it is less than s to the r, okay? With some r, which will, will tend to infinity when c is tending to two. Okay, this is <coughs> quite natural, but in some way, as soon as s, c is between one and two, there is no problem. It is polynomial. Uh, there is also a low, lower bound proving that you cannot have something linear, but even this bound S3 is interesting because if you have some automatic sequence, you know that the polynomial, <coughs> the number of digits of blocks of length S is linear in S, so it cannot be automatic, this sequence. And you have also some more general, uh, how to say, uh, sequences, in some way more general than strictly automatic, which are called morphic. And uh, it cannot be morphic, neither. So there is no real structure about that. OK, so I would like to, to, say, uh, to, to say a bit more about, uh, about this. OK, so what we expect, we, you see, this is a, a work in progress. So this has been published. But in a work in progress, we are also, we think we, we have to check it clearly. But uh, we think that we can prove that the sequence RCM is um, is deterministic. Is, uh, is the the number of elements is always sub-exponential. It's quite possible that it is always polynomial, but this we don't know polynomial growth. But that it is sub-exponential, we, we 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 are surely able to do that. So okay, let me let me 
give something. Oh yes, when you think that something is deterministic, then uh, there is the conjecture of uh, Sarnak, which said that if a sequence is deterministic, essentially it is orthogonal to Möbius function. It is a bit more general than that, and I don't want to go into the, the detail for, for this thing. But essentially, what we proved is that indeed, we don't know whether it is deterministic, but we can prove that it is orthogonal to, to Möbius. So it is in some way another function that, that goes into the, 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 the philosophy of, uh, of Möbius. So I'm just looking at the two normality of residue M of N to the C. And I prove that for any C. The two, you, you, you remember, the, for, for any C, it is uh, two normal. Because C is at least one, and, it, and C plus one is larger than two. And uh, so the sequence C has to be two normal. OK. So for that, we use a two-dimensional version of the Weil's criterion. So the Weil's criterion, I write it here, it tells you the following, that this time we are not looking at one interval, but we are looking at a, um, a square or a rectangle in 0, 1 square. You are looking at some rectangle i. Then the cardinality, and you have two uh, a sequence of dimension 2 um, real numbers. <coughs> And then what do we say that the cardinality of n up to x for which u n v n in fractional part falls into the rectangle i is what you expect. That is to say the measure of i times x. Measure of i will be of course b minus b1 minus a1 times b2 minus a2, the Lebesgue measure. Okay. So this is to say that it is uh, uniformly distributed mod one in the in dimension two. And the same thing with exponential sum, because you expand uh, the uh, characteristic function of your rectangle uh, with the Fourier series, of course, of dimension two this time. And again, what corresponds to zero, zero will give you the main term, the measure of, of i, and the, all the other one will contribute to an error term. So then it says that for any h1, h2, which are not zero, zero, then there is some cancellation in the trigonometric sum exponential of two pi i h1 un plus h2 vn. Okay, so this is the Weil uh, criterion. Up, 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 up. This is the Weil criterion. Okay, so now we already noticed this equivalence. So we say the same thing that the sequence RCM is too normal if simply you, you want to have, maybe I'll go back to there, you want to say now that in the, um, the fractional part of n plus, n plus 1 to the c over m is in eta, uh, eta 1 uh, over m and so on, and uh, the, the, other, the, the next one with n plus 2 over c is in the other one. So essentially what we say now is that this will be well distributed. The sequence R C of M will be too normal if for any H1 and H2, which are non-zero, there is cancellation in the trigonometric sum, which is exponential of two pi i over M, H1 n plus one to the C plus H2 n plus two to the C. Okay, you want to have cancellation in this trigonometric sum. Okay, fine. Well, it is the same thing as as before, except that there is a new phenomenon that appears here. The new phenomenon is that it may well be that H1, you see, if H1 plus H2 is non zero, then you are happy. It is a very nice function of the size n to the c, and you are very happy. Now, what happens if, if H1, H1, H2, H2 is equal, is equal to, zero. to zero? Then we have some statements that you that H1 plus H2, H2 is not, is not equal to zero. You see, because if H1 plus H2 is equal to zero and H2 plus H2 is equal to zero, then H1, H2 is zero, zero. The interest of that is that if you look at the Taylor expansion of the expression, which is inside the exponential sum, if you look at its Taylor expansion, then you will have something. So the terms of n to the c cancel out. 
But then you have something which will be H1 C1 N to the C minus one. And the next one will be H2 C two times N to the C minus one. And so you have something which is of the size N to the C minus one. But since C is larger than one, then you are happy because you have the cancellation. It is going quickly. You have the cancellation in, the, in your trigonometric sum. And now you understand the problem that if there may be a difficulty, if you have three terms and C is equal to one, because for three terms, you may be, you may find out that, okay, the first thing will cancel out the NC, then the NC minus one will cancel out. And then you are left with something in N to the C minus two, but N to the C minus two is extremely small. And there is no cancellation because this is almost a constant. It's almost zero. So there is no cancellation in your trigonometric sum. So you may suspect from that that it is not normal. Yeah, okay. Weil tells you it is not uniformly distributed, but we are not looking at exact distribution mode one of all the sequence. We are just looking at how it goes for in certain groups of values. Okay. So I would like to, to give you some hint and show you that indeed there is this difficulty and you don't have the normality if you go further. So the normality, you can get it up to C plus one, but you don't get it further. I just give you for that one example. Although, although it doesn't come, you feel from this uh, trigonometry sum that it should be the case. So, okay, you take N plus one to the C mod six. C is between one and um, one and two. Okay, you take n um, uh, n plus one over C mod six, n plus two over C, n plus two to power C integral part mod six, n plus three to the C. You take the integral part and you look at that mod six. And I am just looking at the set n, which is all the numbers for which this block is the block 0 to 1. Well, what can I say? Well, I can look at the following, that if I look at, if I take n in n, and I look at n plus 1 to the c minus 2, n plus 2 to the c plus n plus 3 to the c over 6, then, of course, this is between 1, 6 and 5, 6. Okay? <clears throat> Just look at uh, at the fact that you have the residue which are zero, two, one, and uh, so zero will be. It means that something is between the fractional part will be between zero and one, and the other one will be between two and four. And when you and you take minus two, and you know where it is, and for one it is between one and two, and you look at all that together, and you cannot go out of one over six, five over six. Okay, so it means that the cosine of two pi, this number is less than one half. Good. Okay, but by Taylor expansion, you have the following that exactly what I was telling you. We are killing the two first term. This is why we chose, you see, one, two, one, one minus two, one, because the sum is equal to zero of the H1, H2, H3, one minus two plus one is zero. But also one minus two times two plus three times one is also equal to zero. So it means that in your Taylor expansion, the terms in NC disappears, the term of N to the C minus one disappears, you are left with something which is N to the C minus two. And so if you look at the cosine of this number, this cosine will tend to one because it is almost zero, what you are looking at, okay? <clears throat> so this tends to zero. So of course the conclusion you get from that is that the set n is finite. Because if you are in n, the cosine of this expression has to be less than one half, but when n is large enough, it is close to one. So this set is finite. Now, okay, for, for the time being, we have not done anything with the, with the normality, but now if RCS were three normal, the block zero to one would occur with a probability one over six cube. 
Well, which is positive. It, uh, it's not a finite. The, the set n would be infinite, you see? So you are done with that. Okay, so now you can play, uh, play other, other games like that, but this shows that for any C, if M is taken sufficiently large, then you don't have the, S, the C plus one normality. Okay, now for, uh, I, this was an uh, easy example in some way for C between one and two, but for C between one and two, you can show also that when M is equal to two, it is normal, but uh, for M larger than two, it is not normal, more or less by playing with the IDs that are given here. So, okay, so essentially, I think we were, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, so, uh, so essentially what you have seen is that N to the C is a good way to test different things. First of all, it has polynomial growth. It is, it is quite natural uh, question. It may tell you also how far you can go with C because it is a continuous parameter. This is interesting. And it tells you also whether this sequence is a sequence which is random or which, uh, which keeps some property. For example, for the residue, it tells you that it has the memory. If you look at fibers, fibers, uh, you completely forget about what it was. It is completely random. If you take some little blocks, it's still okay, but it remembers that it is a polynomial of degree C. Okay, so you have, this is why you have this duality of aspects between what is random or non-random. I just wanted to illustrate some of these points. Okay, I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, sir. So, uh, yeah, wonderful yeah. talk here. So, any questions? So, there are questions. So, hello, am I audible? Hello. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you mentioned two theorems in this talk. One was uh, if one is less than c, one is greater than sorry, one is less than c less than twelve by eleven. You mentioned the prime number theorem. Like a version yeah. of prime number theorem with uh, integer part of n raised to c. Yeah. And you also mentioned another theorem which you said was folklore. The density of uh, n such that n raised to c is eta mod m. That was one by m. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking. Yeah. So I was thinking, can we uh, can we get the Dirichlet prime number version of this by considering the density of set n such that uh, integer part of eta plus km raised to c is less than equal to x and that is prime so sorry sorry say say, say it again will that so, say it again just, just yeah. the last yeah the, the last thing you you wanted to consider because i, yeah, yeah. So, I have to, to write it right right so the yeah. density of this set n such that eta plus k n. sorry eta uh, plus density of k such that eta plus km raised to c integer part less than equal to x is prime. Yeah. Is that density approximately x by cm log x? Uh, you can, you can at, um, you, mean, you want to say, uh, looking at primes, uh, in Kedisky, Shapiro primes in arithmetic progression. Right, yes, but, uh, yeah. there is, yeah, there is, there is some, some recent result. I have seen, I tried to, to see the, to see the, 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 the name, sorry, of the author, but there is a Vinogradov, even um, uh, Bombieri Vinogradov result of this but kind. Is the, but is the bound of C the same, like between one and 12 by 11? Yeah, but no, no, so first of all, the bound has been improved upon. Oh. Now it is something like 1.2. I think uh, Riva is involved in the, in, the best, uh, in the best result we have right now. Huh. But, uh, but for the... Um, uh, so it is someone whose, whose name is uh, Lu, and uh, it appeared in uh, Acta Mathematica Sinica uh, in 2018, and it gives uh, it gives the um, uh, Bombieri Vinograd of uh, a result. So is the so of course then C C smaller, C smaller oh. for that. 
you, you cannot have everything at the, at the same time. In some way, you, you have to trade between all the cancellation you, you need in the, in the, in okay, the different like arithmetic yes, progression. But in any case, if it is for a given, given arithmetic progression, yes, it's, uh, right. it's the same thing, essentially. The asymptote is x by this, cm of x. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Yeah, uh, sir, uh, I have a question. So this uh, C is actually bounded in a very short interval, sir. I mean, so all yeah. the bounds that you mentioned are, it's like one and something very close to one. So yes. is, there, is there a reason for that or is it just too hard to go beyond that? Yeah, you see, no, no, it, 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 there, there is a reason. The reason is that you need to have some cancellation in trigonometric sums, and then it starts to be harder and harder when, um, when you have a very uh, a small sequence. You see, uh, if, you, if you want to say, for example, you, you can say, take a, maybe if you, are, if you are used with that, take, a, for example, some alpha given and look at what you can say about the alpha, alpha n square and uh, how this sequence is uniformly distributed. Then in the error term, well, you see that the error term, if you take alpha n square, alpha n cube, alpha, the, 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 the error term would be worse and worse. So the, in some way you can say something on intervals, but this interval would be closer and closer to one, or larger and larger in some way. So th this, is, this is the point. So in some cases, you have nothing to do with the, with, with the size. Uh, for example, in this residue, which is, which is a quite a, the, 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 the only point is that uh, you, you cannot go beyond C. We, we explain why. And we know that after that, it is not normal. So in some way here, we can go rather far. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but uh, b because, because you see, we are starting with something which is extremely regular. We are just looking at the residues mod, uh, mod M. So it is something which is extremely regular. And so we can go far, we, we see. Mm. But uh, if you are looking for prime numbers, you, you have to say that, you see, you have to find a prime number in a very small interval. And this interval will be smaller and smaller when C, when C gets larger. And at oh. some point, you don't know how to do. OK. OK, so thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes. Yes. To you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, th uh, so we'll be going to the inauguration directly. So, yeah, uh, you know, uh, we are inaugurating the integrated MSc PhD program here in newly starting one and as well as a mm -hmm. smart classroom. So, uh, so, okay. Thank you. Well, thanks once again. Okay. Thanks to you. I was happy to be in Kerala this morning and I'd stay for the week.